Amen. Hey, once again, we're in a study of world religions, cults, and the occult. Mary, I'm not even looking at you. Number 14. Give it up for Mary. She gets it right, I think, every single time. That's right. Witchcraft and the rise of wicked. And, of course, by way of recap, because that's what we do, we've already seen the definition, the types, the location, the protection. What's the magical name? I don't mean that in a witchcraft sense. Jesus, hello. Uh, he's always the one for protection, uh, saved or unsaved. Uh, and we've gone through the history, the history of witchcraft, and we took a look at the history of Wicca coming out of the European witchcraft and others. We took a look at their beliefs, and then we took a look last time with their symbols, okay, is what we took a look at. And we saw that Wiccans, <clears throat> and not just Wiccans, but frankly the occult itself, uh, they codified their beliefs into these symbols. And frankly, not just symbols. Uh, a little bit, too, as well in numbers, which, Lord willing, a future study will get into that in much greater detail. But the symbols we took a look at, why do we need to know that? Because uh, people need to be aware. Uh, these symbols are out there in graffiti. They're out there on people's tattoos. They're in their clothing uh, and their communication methods. But if you don't know that they're tied into witchcraft, you're not going to get the secret coded message. that They're involved in that. They're promoting that, etc. blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we took a look at some of the big guns. We couldn't deal with them all. We took a look at the god and the goddess, okay, uh, symbols, as you can see there. Then we took a look at the spirals. Then we moved to the triple crescent. Notice we're getting into the threes, okay, and uh, with the, the triple goddess aspect. Then the pentagram with the five points because each point represents one of the five elements that they use in their rituals. Uh, air, fire, water, earth, ether, or spirit. Then we took a look at the hexagram. And then the universal hexagram, drawn with one uh, continuous line. And the witch is not, once again, that they use that to curse people, hex people, uh, put a death thing on them, and things of that nature. Which, again, hypocrite, Lindsay, you got it right, from the South. Because, again, what's their big thing? Oh, we're so nice, we're so friendly, we do whatever you want, just harm ye none. How is putting a death spell on somebody harm ye none? How many times have we seen this throughout the study? Total hypocrisy. We also saw the sign of the Hecate's wheel. Uh, the Greek goddess of witchcraft, the uh, triquetra, again, three, the power of three, again, triskelion, also three, but it also could be six, 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 three sixes, okay, as well, the septagram, the wheel of the year, we're going to see that in great detail tonight, what they do, their practices, and then we finish up with the solar cross, which is also the swastika, as we ended on the horrible reality of Hitler not just being an evolutionist, that's why he was after the Jewish people, because they were the lowest on his evolutionary list. Hello. Okay. And uh, he felt that they were close to pure ape. Okay. But he was also involved in the occult, in witchcraft. And if people would have known, I'm not going to say it would have fixed everything, but if people would have known that the swastika was a symbol of black occult magic, which Hitler was a massive a part of, then, and the Nazis are wearing that, if they would have known, they're basically saying we're a part of black occult witchcraft, do you think they would have maybe followed them so easily? No, but again, that's the importance of knowing the symbols of the occult and witchcraft. The, the occult will tell you what they're doing, but it'll go in one ear and out the other if you don't pay attention or understand their symbols, their numbers, and things of that nature. Now, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to, the next couple of practices is uh, studies, we're going to get into Wicca's practices, okay, and begin to break that down, and then we'll probably have a final study on the promotion. Where is this all coming from? Uh, beyond just Disney's we've seen I don't know how many different times. But once again, let's turn to the scripture and see why, not just witchcraft, but their practices is something you don't want to ever get involved in. 1 Samuel 28 is our opening text. 1 Samuel 28, and if you find 2 Samuel, what do you do? That's right, take a left. 1 Samuel 28, verses 5 through 19. Now, of course, the uh, context here is Saul and the witch of Endor. Okay, this is one of those occurrences where the scripture records uh, something you should not do. Bad. This is no, no land. Okay, don't do what he did. And this has got some serious consequences. Now, he didn't go to the grocery store. He didn't go to somebody who was just a, an average pagan, knocked on his door and had lunch with him. He went to a what? A witch. Right? All the things that today that people are saying, oh, it's no big deal. You know, people, it's not, no, excuse me. And let's take a look at what happened to him as a result of consulting a witch, and specifically having her do a witch practice called divination. Okay, but let's take a look at that. We'll start with verse 5 there. It says, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was what? He was afraid. Terror filled his heart. All right, now if you trusted in God, would that be the case? I mean, David stood up against Goliath, right? But again, so he's, he's, he's motivated out of fear, right? And so he inquired of the Lord, but the what? 
The Lord didn't answer him by dreams or Urim or the prophets. Why? Because the contextually earlier, he's constantly disobeying God, right? And so God shuts him off, right? And then he makes an even bigger mistake. So then uh, Saul said to the attendants, what? Find me a woman who's a what? Media. Dude, two wrongs don't make a right. You've already rebelled. You didn't do what God uh, told you to do. And now you're going to do this? Come on. Right? But he does. He says, so I may go inquire of her. Uh, and they said, well, there's one in indoor. So Saul disguised himself as if God can't see. Right? Uh, and put on uh, other clothes. And at night, because God can't see in the dark. I mean, it's all, daylight's all he can do. At nighttime, it's just he can't drive. He can't do... We don't ever do that. Act like God can't see what we're doing. Or at night, we're all... Yeah. He did that. And he and two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said. And bring up for me the one that I named. Now, what's he asking her to do? Divination, right? You act as a medium and you bring up a dead uh, spirit, right? But the woman said, surely you know that Saul, what he's done, he's cut off the mediums and spirits from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring him up my death? Well, Saul swore to her by the Lord. When Listen, when the Lord said to get rid of him. And so then he swears by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you'll not be punished for this. Wow, that's a triple no-no, right? Right? So then the woman asked, well, whom shall I bring up for you? And he says, who? Bring up who? Samuel. Samuel was the one he always went to, contextually, the prophet, who, who did uh, inquire the Lord. The Lord didn't answer him, but he, he had died. Right? Well, when the woman saw Samuel, he said, uh, bring up Samuel. So when the woman saw Samuel, she cried at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why do you deceive me? You are Saul. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like, he asked. Well, uh, an old man wearing a robe was coming up. Well, Saul, he knew it was Samuel. So he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And, and Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God's turned away from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Samuel said, dude, you dude, dude. That's Crone translation there. Okay, why do you consult me now that I eat I'm dead, now that the Lord has turned away from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Right? Now, here comes your punishment for this one, buddy. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. And the Lord will what? Hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. In other words, what? You're going to die. Dude, you rebelled so, and now you're doing this, you're going to die. That's it. You got 24 hours, you're dead. You just signed your death, and getting involved in what? In witchcraft, in necromancy, divination. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines, right? So again, why did Saul not just lose the battle the next day? If you keep reading, but why did he and his sons die? Because he had the audacity to turn to witchcraft, specifically the act of what we're going to see is a big theme tonight, uh, divination, trying to get advice, communications, supposedly see the future or get advice from the dead, okay, is what's going on here. God not only condemns it, uh, but Saul was severely punished for it, i.e., he got a death sentence. That was the last, last, last straw with God. Okay, but the question is, before we get into that, is was this really Saul? Because you're going to have a debate typically in the church with theologians. Some would say, no, it's not. Okay, it was just a familiar spirit. Okay, uh, some would say, yes, it is. I kind of lean more towards, yes, it is. Because I don't think the context uh, really would tell us anything uh, different than that. But you're thinking, well, what, there's a problem there. Uh, the scripture is very clear that when a person dies, you go to heaven, you what? Praise God, you stay to heaven. Anybody glad when you get to heaven, you don't come back? <laughs> yeah, or get kicked out. Uh, but when you go to hell, you get a what? You stay in hell. There, there's no crossing. You don't come back. And so so how, how can Saul come back? Well, many would say that this was Saul because this was a special occurrence. This isn't the norm. And that since God is the author of life and the creator of all life, then he certainly has the ability to do that if he wants to do. And that's what they believe. He was using Samuel, he was allowing this special one-time occurrence where a dead person did come back to the earth like that, okay, uh, to, to rebuke Saul, okay, and that's what we see. Now, with that said, that does not mean that witches today or anybody in the occult who's involved in necromancy and acting as a medium to supposedly communicate with the dead, that what they do see, what does come forth, okay, that's not a real person. Now, God did it because he's God and he's got the power to do that. 
Okay, if he so chooses, and he did in this one time occurrence in the scripture, right? But the witches don't, right? Now, I'm not, they, they could hear somebody, and it could look like Aunt Vera or Abraham Lincoln or Cleopatra. I don't doubt that. But is that really Abraham Lincoln, Aunt Vera, or Cleopatra? No, it's what we saw before, a demonic familiar spirit impersonating that loved one. Okay, so I want to clarify that. Uh, okay, because that's what the theme is going to be tonight. We're going to see the practices of Wicca, and one of the big ones is they literally think they're speaking to the dead, okay, to give them great advice. Okay, now, as crazy as that is, uh, it's a good thing that the church isn't involved in mediums and necromancy, and my boy, because we've been studying the scripture, and the scriptures we've been seeing throughout this study, Old and New Testament warns against this, and we would never, are you kidding me? Folks, it's getting so bad out there in the church hypocrisy. I had to share this one with you before we can get started. Uh, we have churches today hiring mediums to be a part of their staff. It's nuts. And, and that's why I had to show you that that's the article. I'm not making this up. Okay, but let me read to you some of this article. And this was this year. This year. Quote, the New Testament describes various roles needed to build up the church, including apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. You know, Ephesians chapter 4. Right? Scripture also describes the gifts of the Spirit that God gives to his people so they can minister effectively. Quote, psychic mediums do not appear on the list of church offices, nor do psychic readings via communing with the dead appear on the list of spiritual gifts. However, one church now wants to train, uh, change this. Uh, quote, psychic medium at a church near you. You've got to be kidding me. It goes on to say this is called Vision Church of Atlanta. This is in Atlanta. And they hired a Dr. LaCara Foster, a star of the YouTube series, The Gift. The gift she's talking about is being a medium. And she's a graduate of the International Theological Center in Atlanta. Can I translate that for you? That ain't a Bible college. <laughs> that's probably something online you go through to get a certificate. But that makes you a doctor. Okay, but well, whatever. Uh, but anyway, so she says, quote, she wants to heal people to, quote, give voice to the spirits and help us reframe church and psychic mediumship and she says and that's why she did her doctoral thesis so as if that makes it okay she says one of the reasons i pursued my doctorate on this topic was because i really want to understand my gift from the intersections of uh, afrocentrism and christianity and why the church believes this gift shouldn't be considered a spiritual gift among those listed in the bible uh, because it's not listed in the bible and it's listed as a practice by the occult that god condemns that's why it's crazy. But she says, being a medium allows me to communicate with our loved ones who are departed. For me, it was very important that I was able to merge the two for my love of God and my psychic abilities. But notice that's what it is. You're just making it up as you go. In the church. Not witchcraft. We saw they're based on relativism. Make it, I'll take a little bit of this, I'll merge that, I'll do that. Now it's in the church. She goes on to say... Uh, she says she came to believe she had special skills long ago, but she kept them under wraps. She follows in the footsteps. Remember this guy from our New Age study, Edgar Casey. Remember him, the sleeping prophet? She says she's not only following his footsteps, but uh, if you recall, he was not only a medium that got the supposed message. Guess what he did? He taught in the church as a Sunday school teacher too. How could somebody like that get involved in a church and teach a Sunday school class? Because people do not... Do their homework. That's how. Okay, and that's why. They take any warm body. Foster, likewise, says one of her goals, a direct quote here, listen to the audacity, is to, quote, rewrite the Bible to include mystic mediumship as one of the spiritual gifts. You're going to be in a heap of trouble with God. She says her unique calling be claimed clear. Now, listen, how could somebody do this? How can somebody say that they're a Christian? How could a church hire somebody on the staff? Well, here's the basis. Do you think it's this? No, because if you stand by this, you don't hire that person. You certainly don't promote this, right? No. Here it is, and this is a direct quote. Her unique calling became clear to her after, quote, God told her. There it is. Now, what community uh, is in the church that that's their whole basis of operation? And you wonder why we spent 42 weeks on that, folks. You go down that route when you get away from the Bible, and God told me to tell you I had this dream or vision, and this is what you end up with. You're flat out merging with the occult, and that's what's happening from another angle again. She said this, I was reluctant at first because I, I felt very vulnerable and thought that I would get a lot of pushback and negative feedback for being a minister and a medium. Oh, so you're supposed to be not a doctor, but you're, you're a pastor. No, the scripture doesn't have female pastors. But again, who, who allows that? Not only the God told me crowd, but the charismatic community. Second 
mistake. I thought people wouldn't understand, she said, but I knew I still had to do it. I knew I had been called it. And then listen to this. Listen to the audacity. She said, but so I asked God. God, why, why this gift? Why not singing? Quote, God said, I promise my people eternal life. How will my people know that I've kept my promise if you don't demonstrate your gift? Can I tell you something? That ain't God's voice. You might have heard something, but that ain't God. And if you want to hear from God, read the Bible. Yeah, but I want to hear from him out loud. Then read it out loud. Right? Again, that's how far off things are. God told me to tell you, and, and then that's all emotion you were. And that's, that's my, anyway. The Vision Church of Atlanta, that's not only their only problem. They hire mediums, but their pastor is a, a, a gay, and, uh, and they are a part of the, quote, United Progressive Pentecostal Fellowship of Churches. Again, come, you, you, once you do that, you get off the Bible, folks. That's what you end up with. Okay, but it goes on to say in the article, it says, uh, well, the Bible says in Leviticus and De uh, Deuteronomy and elsewhere, strongly it condemns spiritism, mediums, the occult, and psychics. In fact, quote, Saul died after consulting a medium. And here's a church that's hiring one. So-called church. you got to be kidding me. Are we living in the last days or what? Okay, but Foster appeals to people's understandable hunger, quote, to hear from lost loved ones. Right? I mean, don't you? I mean, you know, one of the trends in churches today is have you know grief classes. You know, as people get older and sometimes their spouse dies and they're still around and they just miss them so bad. And you know what we're gonna do? We're not we're not gonna encourage them in God's word. We're gonna hire a psychic medium so they can talk to that dead person in the church. Isn't this nuts? Crazy, appealing to people's sense of stuff. Okay, uh, but anyway, so let's get into the practices specifically. Even this one called divination tonight wiccan practices unfortunately this behavior is going on today and apparently it's getting so popular that it is merging now unfortunately with the apostate church now the first one we're going to take a look at is what we've been dealing with uh, in our scripture and what i just gave you is an example and that is the practice of divination okay now before we get into the divination there's different modes and methods that they do we're going to take a look at the tools that they use for divination or a lot of the rituals that we might get into in the next study. But let's take a look at some of the tools that they use uh, to do the dirty deeds. Let's take a look at that. The art of witchcraft is enhanced by the way of magical tools, just like any religion since the dawn of time. Each tool has a specific purpose during a ritual. Some tools have more than one purpose and can be supplemented for another if need be. Each of these tools enables the follower to channel their energy, intent, or focus more clearly for their own magical working. The athame is a small double-bladed knife. There are often magical symbols carved into the hilt. The athame is used to direct magical power. It has many magical uses including casting a circle, charging objects with energy, and as a symbol of the god during the Great Rite. The athame stands for the element of fire, the athame is for cutting on the ethereal or spiritual plane. A bell is a ritual tool used for invocation and banishment that represents the goddess. It is used to invoke the goddess as well as drive away negativity from a circle. It can be used to signal the beginning of a rite and or to disperse the energy after the spell work is complete. The boline is a white-handled knife, often having a curved blade. It is used in ritual for physically cutting objects in the earthly plane. It can be used for cutting ritual cords, cutting herbs, or inscribing candles. It is the practical, utilitarian knife used during a ritual. A cauldron is a large metal pot, often made of cast iron that has three legs. The three legs are symbolic of the three aspects of the goddess, and the large bowl is symbolic of the womb. A cauldron has many uses in rituals, including indoor or outdoor ceremonial fires, scurrying, holding ingredients necessary for the ritual, or burning items during a ritual. A chalice is a cup that is intended to hold a drink for ritual purposes. It can be made out of any material, and it often holds wine, water, or other libations preferred by the individual or coven. It is the symbolic representation of the womb as it holds and contains the life-giving force. Together with the athame, it is used to represent sexual union during the Great Rite. The five-pointed star represents the element of earth. It is often made of copper, but can be constructed from clay, metal, or paper. 
Some Wiccans cast a circle by rolling it around the edges of the sacred space. The pentacle is a tool that is used to summon certain energies or spirits. Normally, it is the centerpiece of an altar where it holds various objects such as mooncakes, salt, amulets or charms. The wand is a thin, straight stick that is held in the hand. It is generally made from a sacred wood such as willow, birch, hazel, oak or elder. It is generally one to one and a half feet long. Oftentimes it is carved or decorated with personal items such as crystals and gems. So it's kind of a breakdown of not all of them, but most of the tools that they use in their practices, including divination. Notice that the cauldron not only was something that they could boil and make their spells and, and concoctions with their potions, uh, but it was used for scrying. We'll get into that in a second, that you have the water and you stare into it. And same thing with the chalice, the water, and things of that nature. Also notice the pentagram had a moon cake. Pay attention to that. We're going to see a little bit later. A cake. They offer cakes with cakes. with the Anyway, so all that stuff. So that's their tools. Now let's get into some of their methods. And again, the first one we're going to take a look at is called scrying. Okay. Uh, one person says, if you spend any time either online or watching TV, you've seen all kinds of opportunities for psychic services, right? That they're going to communicate to the dead. It's all over the place. Wicca's had a long, long uh, line of practice with this. So is witchcraft and the occult from the get-go. We saw way back in Babylonian days. Okay. Uh, they use it for personal or group practices. Okay. And again, what they do and when they try to, uh, with these practices, uh, they try to gain knowledge about the future. Uh, it could be for personal advice uh, and things of that nature about a situation, whatever. But basically, what they think they're doing is communicating with the spirit world, with a, a, a dead person, a dead spirit or entity, or, or as we saw before, tapping into the astral plane to get all this knowledge. It's supposed to be floating out there, blah, 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 blah. Okay, but it's a common practice. And again, not just with Wicca, uh, but pretty much all the occult uh, is involved in this. And so is New Age, by the way as we saw many times before, all right? So let's get into this aspect of the uh, scrying. Now scrying, again, as you can see there, uh, you could do it in a couple different ways. Uh, you could stare at a crystal ball is one of the things, some sort of a reflective surface. You could stare at in the cauldron there, they mentioned in the tools, uh, water, right, is a reflective surface. That's what nose hair Damas, I mean Nostradamus did, right? He got on hallucinogenic drugs and he stared in water. That's called scrying. That's a witchcraft occult technique. That was, and I'm supposed to listen to him uh, for future events more than Bible prophecy? Yeah, somebody been eating chicken too long. Okay, one bite's too long. Uh, anything's too long with chicken. But anyway, it's called foul meat for a reason, Pastor Bobby. But anyway, so that's scrying. But it's also, as we saw, it could be a mirror. So we saw mirrors are big in the occult. You stare at the mirror. It's a reflective surface. Okay. It could be fire. We saw last time. You look in the flame, right? And, you know, and, and things of that nature, okay? But scrying involves when you stare at this reflective surface, okay, it puts you into, quote, a deep meditative state. That's called an altered state of consciousness, okay? Uh, you don't want to get involved in that, but that's what they do. And during, when you're doing that, the, quote, individual sets an intent as to what they wish to have revealed to them. While doing so, it said that images often appear within the media being used, the crystal ball, bowl of water, whatever, okay? And then you could be, do this to, quote, discover your past life. Well, there's another big mistake. Is there such thing as a past life? No, you got one life to live, and that's not a soap opera. That's biblical truth, Hebrews 9, 27, right? As we've seen many times before, it's appointed man to die once, uh, then face a judgment, right? Okay, but they think that they can do that. They can receive through all this practice guidance on current situations, sometimes receive supposedly images of the future, or sometimes just different shapes and colorful hues uh, will be seen. Typically in the movies, you'll see that version of scrying in the crystal ball, and there's just like smoke and mist and different colors. And then, of course, what does that mean? I don't know. Quote, the different shapes and hues will mean different things. In other words, make it up as you go. I think what that means is, uh, yeah, whatever. Okay, but that's just one. There's many different ways. We're only going to deal with a couple, and we've got to move on. The next one's called rune casting. Okay, rune casting. Uh, we'll probably get into these uh, later when we get into some of the eclectic ones, uh, individual ones I want to deal with, like druidism and things of that nature, because this is where this comes from. So runes uh, are used as a purpose of divination. Runes is an alphabet. Uh, it's been around for a long time, since the 2nd century, uh, and in the Germanic and Nordic cultures, okay, and this is their, their alphabet, okay, but let's take a look at a video on, on what is it with these runes, okay? Runic alphabet were used to write various Germanic languages before the adoption of the Latin alphabet. 
Ancient tribes used them to name places and things, attract luck and fortune, provide protection, and magically divine the course of future events. Because runes were carved into stone or wood, they were formed with straight lines only. While these symbols have various origins and meanings, Wiccans attach their own personal significance to them, and all can be used as symbols of power and protection in your craft. Okay, so basically, again, I'm, we'll have probably another study on this in greater detail, but the runes are basically uh, this, quote, ancient alphabet, the runic alphabet. And if you've ever wondered why, uh, it, you know, they're always just straight, symmetrical lines, because a lot of times it was done written in stone. And uh, I don't know if you ever tried to write a letter in stone, have fun doing a circle with a knife, <laughs> right? You know, so it's just, that's how they literally... Uh, why it's that fashion, okay? But that what they do is they take this rune alphabet and each letter is supposed to stand for something. They basically just shake it up like a roll of the dice or something. And then that's supposed to tell you your future, give you wisdom and all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, the spirits are going to put it in the right direction, whatever. Uh, we're not going to get into this, but other common similar uh, methods of we saw before in the Africa study, uh, what they'll do is they'll take bones, bones and things, and they'll just shake it all up and they'll throw it there on the ground and the way that they land is supposed to give you a, a you know a message and things of that nature also um i remember doing a term paper on babylon uh in uh, bible college and one of the things i learned is of course involved in witchcraft as we saw in great detail in our study uh but what they do is they would do the innards of an animal right they would cut an animal open and basically pfft, how the guts came out that was another you know so it's kind of that similar thing. Somehow that's how you're going to depict the future or get special knowledge or, or tell that guy this is the time to attack and you're going to win because the guts tell you. You know, it's just crazy. But, uh, but people get into this, including this next one. This is probably one of the more popular ones out there, tarot cards. Right? We dealt with this in great detail in our New Age study, but just by way of recap, this is probably one of the most well-known divination tools. And, of course, Wicca, witchcraft, and the occult uses it as well as New Age. Been around since about the 1400s. The deck contains 78 cards. It's split into two categories, Major Arcana and the Minor Arcana. And, of course, each one, kind of like the rune alphabet, stands for something. Each card is supposed to stand for something. And, basically, when you put the cards out, whatever, it's supposed to have a special message and kind of the same kind of thing okay but let's take a look at oh by the way uh I, i'm not going to show it to you and we might get into this a little bit at the end of the study of how why are so many people getting involved in witchcraft and wicca today because it's being promoted all over the place including youtube right and a lot of these uh, videos that i've been sharing with you are coming straight from the you the witches channels and part of the reason why is because i want you to hear from them from their own mouth this is what they believe this is what they do right but as you and i on a sunday as we worship Jesus Christ, we come together as the church, right? On, 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 and and we would, it's a time of fellowship. It's a time of being encouraged in God's word. Witches are encouraged on Sunday. Yeah, get together and do tarot cards. Find out how your week's going to go, right? Let's take a look at that. This is a seven-card spread to help you get insight on the flow of energy that you'll experience in the coming week. A perfect spread for a Sunday afternoon or evening, the main goal here is to determine what kind of energies will be dominant around you in the next seven days. You will need a standard tarot deck, but you may use an oracle deck instead, a pen, and paper. Find a printable tarot guide for this spread below the video. Place the deck on your altar or table and set the mood for this ritual by diffusing essential oils such as cinnamon or lemon, or burn some incense. You can also light a yellow candle for mental clarity, and decorate your space with a gemstone such as amber, carnelian, or tiger's eye. Wait a second there. Do you know anybody else that's big on incense and candles and ringing bells? Yeah, it rhymes with Roman Catholicism, for those who are wondering. wonder where they got those practices from, because what's that got to do with studying the Bible? Did you also see how witchcraft, and this was their words, not mine. They don't just use oils. What's their word? Essential oils. Isn't that a big thing in the churches nowadays? Essential oils, you got to have essential oils, and somehow that's going to heal your body and do all this weird stuff. Folks, you better do your homework on that if you're involved in that stuff. Uh, witchcraft uses the same stuff. You want some healing? You need to pray, okay? Uh, things of that nature. Uh, but anyway, here's what they say with these, and there's many more, but we're just, this is one of their practices, and there's many more we've got to get to. So, uh, but listen to what they say. This, this is from the witches. <clears throat> when you're involved in divination, 
with this stuff. Quote, keep it positive. Don't try to conjure up a demon or some low vibrational entity. Well, duh. But guess what? That's what you're going to do. That's why God condemns this. That's why you shouldn't get involved in it. And they say this, uh, and they, they smack on you and I. This is from the witches. Contrary to what religions like Christianity teaches, divination is not inherently evil. It's an excellent way to get in touch with your higher consciousness in the spirit realm. No, it's an excellent way to get involved with demon, de demonic activity. Uh, you don't want to mess with it. Now, that's just one thing. Now, the second practice, okay, and this is the hub, pun intended, uh, the Wiccan calendar. Also, as we saw last time, uh, briefly, the wheel of the year. And basically, even though Wicca is considered a, um, uh, a non-organized, quote, religion, uh, this is uh, pretty much a centerpiece of pretty much all Wiccans. Right? Remember we saw some, though, will do this, and they'll focus on this aspect. Some will do this practice. Some won't do that. Some will. Some take this, whatever. But pretty much all of them are going to follow what's called the Wiccan calendar or the wheel of the year. And this thing basically uh, is made up of eight holidays that they call sabbats, okay, to provide regular occasions for them to get together, okay, as well as uh, that tell them when to get together to do certain rituals throughout the year, okay. This could be done individually. Uh, this could be done uh, in, in covens, and, and right, but it's just their, their regular cycle of when we need to meet and do our rituals. It's all based on a cyclical, cyclical calendar. Okay. Now, what you're going to see, pay attention. We'll talk about this more in detail afterwards. I want to let the witches show you what they do throughout the year, and then when they're done, it starts all over again. And this is their driving force. This is the heart of Wicca. Pretty much all Wiccans are going to follow this. Okay. But as you're going to see, uh, pay attention. You're going to see, basically in a nutshell, and we'll talk about it after, Roman Catholicism has taken the occult calendar and Catholicized it, including with the specific dates for Christmas or Christ Mass, Easter, and believe it or not, they're the ones behind Halloween, which is their first major holiday. But let's take a look at them. Wiccans honor both the lunar and solar cycles of nature through various rituals and celebrations called sabbats and esbats. The changing of seasons as the sun travels across the sky and the earth turns upon its axis are marked through various celebrations and traditions called sabbats. The solar cycle is broken into eight sabbats and is collectively referred to as the wheel of the year. The Wheel of the Year represents not just the marking and passing of time, but the never-ending cycle of nature's fertility. There are two equinoxes, two solstices, and four minor points that fall in between each of these in the Wheel of the Year. Sabbats are celebrations that bring the community together to recognize the change in seasons. Many followers believe that these eight holy days connect them to Mother Earth and her bounty. This is the beginning of the pagan year, often referred to as the Day of the Dead or the Witch's New Year. Samhain, pronounced Sao in translates to summer's end. It is the time when the sunlight begins to recede and the darkness grows. During this Sabbat, we can celebrate and honor the dead as the veil between the worlds is the thinnest. When the veil between the everyday world and the netherworld thins, Communication between the living and the departed becomes easier through various forms of divination. Samhain is a time to remember and honor the ancestors. Yule is celebrated on the darkest day of the year, as it is the winter solstice. The amount of daylight is shortest during the day. Yule celebrates the coming of the light as the daylight begins to slowly lengthen. The cycle of nature begins with the birth of the sun god during this celebration. Yule logs were gathered from the land or given as a gift to burn in the home. In more modern times, a piece of wood is often used with three holes for candles and they are lit to symbolize the god, goddess and season. Mistletoe and holly are hung in the home for good fortune and to encourage a hardy crop for the following year. When the first stirrings of spring are in the air, it is time to celebrate Imbolic. The womb of Mother Earth and her fertility are revealed during a holiday that literally translates to in the belly. 
the light is becoming stronger and new life is beginning to spring forth from the earth herself. During this turn of the wheel of the year, the maiden shines as the crone recedes and the sun god reaches puberty. As the sun passes over the celestial equator, the goddess Ostara is honoured. She is the Anglo-Saxon goddess that represents the dawn. Fertility is in full swing during this celebration, complete with eggs, rabbits, seeds and flowers. During Ostara, night and day are in perfect equilibrium, as are the goddess and god. As the days become longer and warmer, the earth fills with energy and life, as it is time for hopes to transform into action. The goddess and the sun god have begun to grow and mature. Beltane is the beginning of summer and once again is a celebration focused on fertility. Balor, also known as Bel, the god of light and fire, was a Celtic deity that helped to ensure the fertility of the earth. Fires were lit on hilltops in his honour to celebrate the return of life. Wiccans celebrate the mating of the sun god and fertile earth goddess on this day and rejoice in the pregnancy of the goddess. The love between men and women is honoured during this sacred bond of love. Dancing and singing around a maypole is a common way to celebrate Beltane. Litha has the longest amount of light of any day of the year. As it is a celebration of the zenith of the sun, it is essentially the opposite of Yule's darkness. On this day, light and life are abundant as the sun god has reached his maximum strength and potential. The goddess is heavy with pregnancy as the earth is heavy with the ripening crops. While Letha is a celebration of the god and goddess at the pinnacle of their life, it is also a time of sadness as it ushers in the decline of the sun. This decline is linked to weakness and death as the wheel of the year once again begins to turn towards winter. Translated as loaf mass, this is the time of the first harvest. As the corn is ripe in the field, Lamas marks the start of autumn. Lunasa derives from the Celtic sun god, Lu, who was associated with the sun. Wiccans believe that at this time the sun god's power begins to wane. But while the sun god begins his decline, the abundance of the goddess is in full swing. She has provided a vast bounty of crops for the harvest. The central focus of this festival is to reap the rewards of all that has been sown. Once again, the day and night, light and dark, are in perfect balance with one another. During the autumn equinox, Wiccans give thanks to the harvest and begin to store the crops that were harvested at Lammers. The darkness is coming and the sun god and earth goddess have significantly aged. The second harvest allows followers to take a moment and breathe deeply, releasing the rush and hustle of everyday life. This relaxation allows for time to reflect back on hard work and enjoy the fruits of our labour that have made this harvest possible. After Mabon, the wheel of the year once again turns to Samhain. And it starts all over again. Now, if you're paying attention, let me just draw out a couple little things. You notice the one uh, Wiccan holiday uh, that they consider a holiday, a uh, ritual day, is Yule, right? Now, what does that sound familiar like? Yule logs, and mention what do they use in their practices, the wreath and the mistletoe, right? We don't have time to get into all that, but what did Catholicism do? Catholicism just took that pagan holiday and merged it with Catholicism. Notice I'm not saying Christianity because Catholicism is not Christianity, and this wasn't done by Christians. This was done by the Roman Catholic Church, okay, which is no friend of Christianity, right? Uh, they also took the uh, pagan holiday Ostara Easter, that you saw with fertility represented by a rabbit and with eggs, amongst other things. And so then they combined that with Resurrection Day. That's why you will always see and have always, at least since I've been pastor here, it's not Easter, it's Resurrection Day uh, because that's a pagan holiday, right? Not time to be legalistic, but that has, bunnies have nothing to do with Jesus rising from the dead, but it has everything to do with witchcraft, right? Now, am I against uh, celebrating Christmas, uh, getting ready to come up this year on that particular date? Even though we know biblically it probably most assuredly was not at that time frame, because that's not when the shepherds would be out in the hills with their sheep, probably more of springtime. I get it, the date's wrong, and I get it that Catholicism was merging with the pagan holiday, okay? 
But I'm not uh, against celebrating the birth of Christ and doing it every year. But that's my point, and that's what you hear from me every year. If you're going to celebrate Christmas, and it's supposed to be about the birth of Jesus, then do it about the birth of Jesus. Not what the world's made it into be, and uh, in absolutely nothingness involved in the coal. If you're going to celebrate Resurrection Day, then celebrate Resurrection Day. That's exciting to me, right? But that's the caveat. If you're going to do it, make sure you do it biblically. Don't kid yourself. But okay, but I guess if you do it in the dark and put clothes on like Saul, God doesn't ever see this. You don't want to merge the two, man. You see that God doesn't put up with that. Okay? But we're going to see tonight that Catholicism is also the one responsible for popularizing Halloween, which we saw is Samhain. Samhain is what, how it reads there, straightforward. But Samhain, okay, or Halloween. And you think, well, how did it get from Samhain to Halloween? That didn't even sound the same. Catholicism. They're the ones that popularized it, and we'll get to that in a second. They merged even that, the first part, the first section of the witch's calendar, Catholicism merged the two. Okay, we'll see that. But what you're seeing is basically the practice. You're seeing the divination. Now you're seeing the wheel of the year. They believe this is it, man. You follow this thing. It's going to be, quote, spiritually beneficial to you as a witch, and it's going to be a great excuse to get together with other witches and people involved in the cult, and it's going to be a great time and a great fellowship and, and blah, blah, blah. So that, that's what they do. It's all by cycle. As you saw, it just goes in a circle. Once you make it, and you go around again. Just keep doing it until you die. And if you haven't repented of your sins and turned to Jesus Christ, uh, and ask him to forgive you, uh, then you go to hell. So you need to get off that circle, <laughs> and you need to get to the cross, right? And you need to get saved through Jesus Christ. Uh, but what they do during this time is, uh, you know, they, they have different uh, focuses. They'll, they'll focus on the goddess and goddess worship uh, during these sabbats, these different sections. Uh, they'll have usually a feast of some kind. Uh, and again, sometimes just a solid practitioner will do this. Sometimes it's a coven. Some, uh, some it's, it's, it's a witch circle that gets involved. Uh, sometimes they'll do this purposely out in public as a way to evangelize. And that's getting a lot easier for them today, isn't it? Right? If you're going to come out and pray against our president, okay, uh, openly, and the news will pick that up, then they're like, hey, we'll start doing our rituals in public. Oh, what's that? Ooh. So it's their fault. But a lot of times, though, they will do it still in secret and very privately. Why? Well, part of it is because you saw with the tools, uh, the, they're do, they do sacrifices too. And that involves animal and, yes, people. Okay? So it's, they're not going to do that in open because they, everybody would find out what you're really doing involved. But Wiccans believe that they can do this. This is going to be great. And, quote, that they can help. They can be, stay in tune with nature more. You know, it's just like a former environmental movement, right? Yeah, that's another smoke stream. Okay. In fact, many Wiccans refer to the uh, participation as the turning of the wheel, as they follow the turning of the seasons and things of that nature. Okay. And quote, it's, uh, it's nice to always have another witchy occasion to look forward to just a few weeks away. So that's kind of their thing. So that's their practice. Now, we're going to finish out on Roman Catholicism and specifically uh, this one called Halloween. How did it go from the witch's first Celebration, the first Sabbat of their calendar, right? Uh, Samhain, okay, and then Halloween. Well, again, you can thank the previous popes for that in the Catholic Church. Okay, let me demonstrate that. One guy says this, Halloween is a time that people say, you know, to, quote, just celebrate the spooky or the scary or the frightening. It's a time for kids to don on masks and demand candy from neighbors. And it's an excuse for adults to dress up in outlandish, terrifying uh, guises that would not be socially acceptable for the rest of the year. Whether it's an innocent day of fun or a night full of fear, Halloween is for the darker side. The pagans had Samhain, and that lives on and rises again and again, even in our modern traditions. Uh, the Samhain comes from the Irish Gaelic for summer's end. It was the Celtic people's New Year's Eve. It marked the last day of the year and summer and the beginning of their new calendar. So this was the beginning of the calendar. We'd have January 1st. This is their first. October 31st, Samhain is the first of their calendar. The Celts believe that on this day, you think, why is there ghosts and ghouls and spirits and demons and all that stuff that's celebrating this day? Because they believed on this day, on their first calendar, first day of their calendar, the veil between the worlds was at the thinnest, and this allowed the spirits to cross and, quote, demons could come into our world very easily and roam freely. 
That's what they believed. People would then, therefore, leave offerings of fruit and wine outside their door to keep these spirits from bringing the family and the livestock misfortune. With the doorway between dimensions at its thinnest point, the dead could also freely move to our realm, they believe, and families, therefore, would set an extra place for their dead relatives. Uh, and special fires would be lit uh, to guide these risen souls to safety. But it wasn't just the realm of the dead that could utilize this thinning of the spirit realm that they can now cross back and forth, they believe, but the living too. This was a time, Halloween, Samhain, the first of their calendar of the witches and the occult, that men and women could use to, quote, divine the future and speak to the dead. So this, again, fits our theme with our opening text was Saul, this is the biggest, best time the occult believes you can practice divination. This is the day, right? And uh, speak to the dead and, quote, spy on the living using mirrors. So how did it get there? How did it go from Samhain to Halloween? Well, here it is. Catholicism took hold of Europe, which is where a lot of this stuff was going on, right? And it stomped out what it could, but it, it absorbed what it couldn't. And it couldn't get rid of Sao Huang. So here's what they did. Uh, Pope Boniface declared back in the day, the 1st of November, All Saints Evening. Now, this is huge, as we saw before in Roman Catholicism. What unbiblical practice do they encourage their followers to do? To pray to the saints. Saints, okay, scripturally, is anybody who's a born-again Christian is a saint. It's hagias, means holy one, that were made holy in Jesus Christ. They've taken that biblical term and they've turned it into an encouragement that people alive today, Catholics, need to pray to dead people. When you pray, communicate to dead people, what does God call that practice? Divination, right? So Catholicism took their practice of divination and merged it with this Sao Wayne. They just relabeled it from Sao Wayne to All Saints Evening. And this became the day that the Catholics celebrated all the dead saints and their works. Okay? Now, another term for saint is hallow. Okay? And they, again, called it, it got went from All Saints Evening, and it went to All Hallows Evening. Right? So now you're getting closer to Halloween. Then, over time, it contracted to All Halloween. And then it basically ended up with Halloween. So that's where it went. It started out Sao Huayn. It's always been the same thing. Catholics basically took their version of divination, praying to dead people, merged the two because they couldn't get rid of it. As we saw before, that's their common practice, isn't it? Remember we saw with the witchcraft in Africa? Here's the snake worship over here. And here's the, the Catholic uh, church facility here. It's like, okay, when you're done there, just come over here. We don't care what you do. Just make sure you, you go to Mass. Right? And so that's what they're doing here too. So that's where they got that from. Uh, Catholicism also incorporated a lot of the pagan beliefs that, listen, the spirits walked on earth at this time. So what does Sao Huayn believe? This is when the, the, the veil was the thinnest and the dead spirits were traversing back and forth. So Catholics said, well, basically... This is when it's easiest to talk to these dead saints. That's all they did. They Catholicized a pagan holiday, right? Now, it was believed, and this is the Catholics, that the souls in purgatory, now is that biblical? No, purgatory to purge, it's a mythical place. It's not in the Bible. You'll never find it in the Bible, right? You'll find it in their version of the Bible with the apocryphal that is full of false teachings where they get it from, uh, but where you go after you die and you're suffering in flames of tor torment. Why? To purge, hence purgatory, a place of torment. And then maybe after a million years, uh, and then you throw in some prayers and give that priest some bucks to pray for you so it can be a, a super, uh, super duper prayer. It might shave off some time and then maybe you might get to heaven. That's total false teaching. Now put that with this. So on this time that turned into Halloween, when the veil was the thinnest, that this is what they do. The souls in purgatory, they believe, would come to earth on this day, because again, the veil is the thinnest, so family members would light fires to help guide them home. In other parts, they would have bonfires or bonfires. 
You also saw maypoles and things of that nature in the, in the video. To help guide the spirits, it became social events for the community. Children would then dress in disguise to ward off all these roaming spirits, okay, including people apparently popping out of purgatory or these dead saints now, again, Catholicism. Uh, and it was known as mumming when the kids would do this, which gave root to guising, Okay, which basically gave root to the, uh, the deals. And so the kids would walk around now uh, with uh, costumes on the houses to collect offering meant for the wandering ghosts. Uh, and of course, now it's all over the place, America, UK, and things of that nature. But let's break it down the practice. And again, you're going to see Catholicism just went this. The first holiday of the pagan calendar merged the two with their version of divination, uh, praying to dead people. Okay, and the first one, of course, is the costumes. Let's talk about that again. The Celts believed, again, that the dead could walk, that they're going to pop on, they're going to be all over the planet because the veils of thin is on October 31st. Uh, and, uh, and then, again, a part of it was, too, that then you can communicate with them and find out your future, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Celts, though, also were afraid of the spirits at this time, and they believed they could damage crops, they could possess the living, they could spread incurable sicknesses, and that's why... The Celts, the pagans, when they did Samhain, uh, they dressed up in scary costumes and animal hides, and they hovered over bone fires in fear. Some of them wore ghoulish costumes so that the wandering spirits would mistake them for one of them and then leave them alone. Oh, you're one of us. And they just go around them. Uh, and others offered, listen, they offered sweets to the spirits to appease them. Here, have a sweet. Get, get away from me, you evil demon, dead person, you, right? That sound familiar? That's where you get your trick-or-treat, little candy thing, and we'll get into that more, uh, even the Catholic version. Uh, also, sometimes they say the Halloween masks were used to hide one's attendance at one of these pagan festivals. Also, we'll probably deal with this in a later study, animism, shamanism, which is still uh, being done today, they believe that they also wore animal masks, okay, and hides, because they believe in these rituals, they would take on that animal's personality and or power and things of that nature, okay? Uh, but anyway, so let's get into the, the sweet aspect, the trick-or-treating part. Well, remember I said with the tools, it said they offered moon cakes, right, in the ritual? Well, Catholicism took this aspect of Samhain, and not just now you can pray those dead people out of purgatory, okay, uh, but they took the trick-or-treating part, and they just turned it into All Souls Day. And then instead of moon cakes, you went around getting soul cakes for the purgatory people, right? Isn't that nuts? That's crazy, right? Uh, anyway, was, uh, the act of trick-or-treating dates back to early All Souls Day from Catholicism. And during the festivities, poor citizens would beg for food and families would give them pastries called soul cakes, again, sweets, in return, listen, for their promise to pray for the family's dead relatives. Right? Now, why would you do that? Because that's a Catholic practice that you need to pray for your dead ones in purgatory to shave off time. So they can hurry up. If you don't think they do this, folks, they still do this today. When I was pastor in New York, heavy duty area of Catholicism, Western New York anyway, I was so hip like a ton of bricks. I didn't realize that, stepping into that scenario. And uh, still to that day, I, I could see, they, they gave out, uh, 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 at Catholic funerals, they gave out an envelope that was a prayer card that you were encouraged to put money in. And if you put money in, then they would give that card to the priest and he would pray for your loved one to get time off of purgatory. Don't know your Bible. That's a good way of making some serious cash. They still do it today, folks. Still do it to this day. But that's what they're doing. So they're going around getting these sweet cakes, these soul cakes, as a promise to pray for their dead relatives. Okay, so give me something sweet, and I'll pray for that dead person to get out of here. You know, at least they didn't have to give them cash, but you had to give them some sort of a sweet. Uh, the distribution of soul cakes was encouraged by Catholicism as a replace, uh, way to replace the ancient practice of leaving food or wine to Roman spirits, i.e. from the pagans. They just Catholicized it. The practice was then referred to as going a souling and was eventually taken up by children who would visit the houses in the neighborhood and sometimes they would uh, not only get sweets or soul cakes, but they would give them ale, food, and money. Okay, uh, you know, I'm going to pray for that dead person. Uh, the purpose of All Souls Day is to, quote, 
pray people out of purgatory with prayer, almsgiving, and the mass. But hello, this is unbiblical. Okay, but that's where that practice comes from. Also, they believe that uh, on Halloween, uh, to keep the ghosts away, people would place uh, bowls of food and things to appease the spirits again. It's just been Catholicized. Now, let's get into another one. Uh, the jack-o'-lantern. <clears throat> Why does that take place? Well, as the story goes, at least in the pagans, and then we'll see how it got turned around by Catholicism. Again, uh, as the Celtic lore, the reason why it's called a jack-o'-lantern is the tale was a drunken farmer named Stingy Jack. Okay? It was so wicked, they say, that when he died, he couldn't go to heaven and he couldn't go to hell. Which obviously is not biblical, but that's what they believe. So they believe that he was unable to enter either one, and so he's just basically floating around and roamed around in darkness. So he's in dark, so what's he do? He hollowed out a turnip, and he placed a burning coal inside to light his way as he's roaming in between, supposedly, the worlds, right? In Catholicism, so how did they turn that thing around, right? Again, they take pagan beliefs, and they Catholicize it. Catholicism's, quote, uh, supplicants moved from door to door asking for food, again, in uh, uh, return for prayer for the dead, as we saw, and they would carry out hollowed out turnip lanterns whose candle symbolized the soul that was in purgatory. Get it? So they didn't just show up to your house. They had the jack-o'-lantern. In this case, it started out as turnips, which is what the pagans did. They put a candle in there, and that represented that dead loved one. Hey, Uncle Joe, do you want him out? Give me a soul cake. Give me something sweet. Isn't this nuts? Absolutely crazy. Now, how did it get to pumpkin? Well, in the 1800s, it starts coming over to North America. Uh, pumpkins replaced turnips because they were plentiful and a lot easier to hollow out and do the dirty deed. Okay, quote, the beliefs behind this custom, purgatory prayers for the dead, are not based on the Bible. Again, when you're praying, thinking you're communicating with somebody who's dead, what is that called in the Bible? Divination. Okay, you don't need to be a part of it. You shouldn't be a part of it, okay? Uh, and, and then back to the pagans, the Celts carved jack-o'-lanterns to guide lost souls home on the eve of Samhain, or what's called Halloween. Let me give you another one. And this was for divination, right? And that's bobbing for apples was another one. Uh, the Celts believe that uh, bobbing for apples, or fruit, literally, uh, was a form of divination. Here's how it was supposed to work. Bobbing for apples was a practice where people would dunk their heads in a vat of water and try to bite into the floating fruit in order to figure out their future spouse. Right? It's a form of divination. Uh, ladies would mark an apple or a piece of fruit. They would throw it into the tub of water, just randomly with all a bunch of other fruit, right? And thinking that, that uh, the one that they pulled up and whoever's name was on that and you pulled it out of the water, that was the one you were destined to marry, right? Which, again, sounds goofy. It's like, oh, child's like, that's a, that's a form of divinity. You're trying to figure out the future, and this goes way back, not just with the Celts. This goes way back to Rome. Remember we saw in our history section, Rome was heavy duty in the, in the occult and witchcraft. In ancient Rome, cider was drawn, and Romans bobbed for apples as a part of divination that supposedly helped the person discover their future marriage partner. So it's an old occult divination practice. Uh, today. Now, let's get into some other ones because, again, Halloween, Catholicized, Samhain, the first day of the witch's calendar, which they believe was the thinnest of the two worlds where spirits can go back and forth. I'm telling you, the big thing about this one still to this day is it's the best time to do divination. Now, first of all, that you should never do divination, but this is what the occult believes. Let me give you some other practices that Halloween was all about that, and people were encouraged to do what Saul did. Let me give you some other ones you may not have heard of. Uh, on Halloween, many, uh, again, used it to try to identify different uh, techniques, not just bobbing for apples, uh, to find out their future spouse. Uh, and, uh, and basically, the idea was it would happen by the next Halloween, right? Uh, you would be married. Let me give you a couple of different other techniques besides the apples. A matchmaking cook might bury a ring in her mashed potatoes on Halloween night, hoping to bring true love to the diner who found it. So we've got a big old pot of mashed potatoes, apparently. 
stick in the ring, and whoever got that, you know, and you'll find out one, keep eating, <laughs> as you lost your tooth, <laughs> right? You know, but the good news is, sorry about your tooth, but uh, by next Halloween, you're going to get married, right? But that's a form of divination, right? Uh, fortune tellers, okay, uh, recommended that an eligible young woman uh, would name a hazelnut for each of her suitors, then toss the nuts into the fireplace. And the nut that burned to ashes, rather than popping or exploding, was the girl's future husband. Another form of divination. Again, notice fruits and nuts, which is a big part of the time as well. Another said that if a, a young woman ate a sugary concoction made out of walnuts, hazelnuts, and nutmeg before bed on Halloween night, she would dream of her future husband. Okay? Uh, also, as you know, Halloween traditions often involve fruit centerpieces, apples, and nuts. Why? Three of the sacred fruits of the Celts were acorns, apples, and nuts, and especially hazelnut because it was considered a god, and acorn because it was sacred with this association with the oak tree, which is a huge part of their worship, their pagan worship. And fruits and nuts were related to the Roman harvest of Pomona, who was the goddess of fruit, so way back then. Uh, young women... I'll show you a couple of, uh, these are some old school uh, things that used to go on during Halloween, even here in America. Young women would toss apple peels over their shoulders, hoping that the peels would fall on the floor in the shape of their future husband's initials. So you can see that girl peeling away, man. I'm going to find out who he is, right? That was one of them. Uh, also, they tried to learn about their futures by peering into egg yolks floating in a bowl of water. Uh, you know that's evil. Because we all know what eggs are. Eggs are embryonic evil. Evil in its early stages. You need to step on that thing before it has a chance to grow up and become a menace to society. All right. But anyway, egg yolks in, wa in water. Why? Because that's a reflective surface, just like witches. What? And that's, that's a form of scrying. But again, why was this always done on South Wayne, or now the Catholicized Halloween? Because that's when they believe the, e the best time to do divination. And you can commune with the spirits. Or look at that center one. Uh, the center one is they believe that if you stood in front of a mirror in a darkened room and you hold a candle and you looked over your shoulder, your husband's face would appear. Right? And that's what that middle one is depicting there. Some of the other ones. Uh, and some of them, too, were competitive. Uh, the first guest who found a burr on a chestnut hunt would be the first one to marry or kind of a double thing from the apple bobbin thing, uh, not just find out who it is, but the first one to do it would be the first one down the aisle. Okay, it was also what they taught. Uh, and again, it was all for romantic advice uh, to avoid, quote, seven years bad luck. Each of these Halloween rituals for what? For divination depended on, here's an oxymoron for you, the so-called goodwill of the spirits i.e. demons. You think the demon's going to have your goodwill for you? No, not at all. In fact, let me give you one more. There's also reports, uh, another form of divination during this time, they would have fortune cookie-like favors that would be given out during uh, time. And what they would do is people wrote messages on pieces of paper in milk, right? And then notes were folded up and they were placed into walnut shells. The shells would be heated over a fire causing the milk on the paper to brown just enough for the message to mystically appear on the paper for the recipient. You ever do that with lemon juice? Lemon juice, you write in lemon juice, you can't see it, but if you put it over a flame and heat up, and all of a sudden the lemon juice turns brown on the paper, and you can see what you wrote in lemon juice. Okay? Okay, and that's apparently what we did in Kansas when we had nothing to do. So, but anyway. But as you can see, what, what's happening? We don't have time to get into Ostara or Easter, we don't have time to get into Christ Mass or Yule, the other ones. But what's going on here? How did this get so popular today? How's it even how's it how's it merged to the church? How is it that even the church is now merging so comfortably with witchcraft and the occult that they're hiring them to be a part of their staff? Because people are not studying the Bible. They're outside the Bible with God told me. They would rather turn to divination practices to find out the future or find out advice on something than turn to God's word. And if he condemned that with strong action against Saul, what do you think he's going to do today? You don't have a part of this, folks. But I think part of it, too, is because people 
even in the church, are not teaching on this stuff. I just had another, I, it blew me away. Had yet another, even after all these studies, and we still got more to go. Uh, another person, I guess, claimed to be a Christian, maybe they are, I don't know, said, we should, they, he, rebuking us, we should not be studying this stuff. You shouldn't study about Satan. You just need to study about God. Excuse me? Every single study we're dealing with comes from God's word. Because Satan is real, the occult is real, and it comes with horrible consequences. And because God loves us, he wrote a ton about it to warn us not to get involved in it. So how could you say not to study that? In fact, the fact that you have that mindset, number one, guess where that's coming from? To keep you in the dark is the one you said we shouldn't study. Where do you think that thought's coming from? Not from God. You've got to study it. And again, you've got to study it not just for yourself so that we can warn those who are involved in this, get out of it. And the good news is, even if you've gone down that route, you can get out of it and be rescued through Jesus Christ, no matter how far you've gone. Like this girl. We'll close in prayer after this. I shouldn't have been born. My own mother didn't want me. There must have been something wrong with me because nobody wanted me, you know? Nobody wanted to raise me, love me, take care of me, let me be their daughter. Liberty grew up with deep feelings of rejection after her mother left her and her brother on their father's doorstep. She wanted to party. She wanted to, to do her thing, and she couldn't do that with two little babies. And so, you know, she decided to give us up. After several turbulent years with her father, Liberty moved back in with her mom, who introduced her to drugs and alcohol. At a young age, her mother also exposed her to the occult. She always had a, a large bookshelf that was full of uh, witchcraft books with spells, chants, um, ways to curse people. She had tarot cards, a Ouija board, all that. Everything was, that was normal um, in my mom's household. When Liberty was 14, she had an argument with her mother's abusive boyfriend and found herself rejected again. I came home off the bus and there was a box of stuff sitting outside. There was a note that my mom had left that said, um, he's in, you're out. You have to find somewhere else to live. Now, this is my reality. My mom doesn't love me. She, she never wanted me. She doesn't care. She found acceptance in the party scene and had relationships with men who gave her a place to stay and supplied her with drugs. I did whatever I had to do to survive. I was alone, I was lost. The crystal meth and the drinking was very heavy. I mean, it was a daily thing. It wasn't just like, let's go party on a Friday night. I mean, it was every single day, drinking drugs, drinking drugs, staying up for days. She also began experiencing strange phenomena and some unsettling symptoms. I was hearing voices, I was seeing things. Um, I would get up in the night and I would feel like something was speaking to me and uh, was coming after me. I had sores, uh, little open sores around my body. A friend's parents set up a meeting with their pastor. Liberty reluctantly agreed to see him. I had no belief in God or spiritual beings or anything like that. And he basically just said, all these are symptoms of uh, a demonic attack on you. And the only way to deal with it is rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. Days later, she had a terrifying encounter. These dark images began to just cover the walls and they were like enclosing in on me like they were coming after me. I did what the pastor said and I rebuked in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And then the fear was gone and everything I was feeling was gone. It was literally just gone. The demons, everything just disappeared. Liberty says she learned there was power in the name of Jesus, but knew little else about him. I just uh, felt like I needed this Jesus that could make demons flee. I don't have to wait to go to church and be called to the altar, I can just sit right here in my living room and accept Christ, you know. She surrendered her life to Christ, then fell into a deep sleep. 
When she awoke, she was in a struggle for her life. Something was holding me down and not, just not letting me up, not letting me speak. If feeling like a hand was over my mouth, I just began to say, Jesus, I was just trying to get the words out, and I said, Jesus. It was very muffled, Jesus, and I felt like it was at the top of my lungs. And, and, and the thing that was covering my mouth just was slowly leaving, like letting go. The last thing I yelled was, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And at that moment, uh, whatever was holding me down removed itself. And then I heard this really loud scream, like an evil, loud, wretched squeal sounded as if it was leaving. It could no longer reside because Jesus was now the Lord of my life. Liberty knew she was free. She began to throw away anything that connected her to the darkness she once accepted as normal. I knew that the Lord was, was basically in that one moment cleaning up my whole life. He was just like, it's all gone. You know, I'm, I'm, you're letting it all go. I'm taking it all away from you. You're being set free. I finally was me. I was never me before. I was never, who's Liberty? You know, who, who's this, this girl that was born um, with no purpose, no value, um, no reason to live? He took everything out of me and healed me of, of all the, the horrible things that the world basically dished out on me. My life has changed forever because of that day. This is what I've been waiting for my entire life. And this is what it feels like to know a love that you never got, you never received before. I was born for a purpose, and it's to serve Jesus Christ and to do his work. He's the only one that can set you free. Including getting involved in the occult. I loved about her testimony is that's what happened to me. I was all by myself. I was in a church service, and it was just so amazing, a bare bones faith, just calling upon the name of Jesus Christ and asking him to forgive me, and bang, instantly. Literally, the demons were gone. That's why we need to understand this, folks, because there's people out there all around us. You may not know it, but they're involved in these things. And they're infected with demons, surrounded by demons, and they're living in torment. The good news is we can tell them about Jesus because he can set them free. Amen. Lord willing, next week we're going to uh, continue on with the practices. And, uh, and then we'll finish out, Lord willing, with the promotion. And then we'll head out to the next section on Satanism. Gets even worse. But uh, we're going to, I'm over time, so we're just going to pray and dismiss. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Once again, thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your strong warnings. You, you love us so much. You're very blunt, and it's a simple truth. Uh, we, we don't need to pray and fast, and hopefully we can get it figured out. You're very, very forthright with don't ever get messing around with the occult and their practices, including divination. So, God, we just praise your people that we do what you tell us to do, to, to come out from among that, that uh, what does light have in fellowship with darkness? What, uh, what fellowship is there between Christ and Belial or Satan? We need to stick to you, and we need to promote you in this dark and dying world because it's only you and the light of your truth that will set people free like liberty, as we just saw. So, God, please help us as your people to understand that we are on the greatest mission of all, the greatest rescue mission. There's nothing more exciting, nothing more important than telling other people how to get out of this dark, messed up world that the little G God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. There's a spiritual warfare going on. Satan is real, demons are real. But the good news is, God, they don't have to be in that anymore. Not for even a second. If they would just turn to you, Jesus. Help us to be faithful to tell them about you. No matter what. Please bless our studies to these lives that belong to you. We ask all this in your wonderful name.